Casino Event Center tomorrow at 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. and it's a public participation hearing on um, <coughs> excuse me order instituting investigation of rural call um, completion. So what? rural call completion. I just found out about this yesterday. I guess the rural call didn't get completed. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure. But it sounds pretty fancy because the, uh, <laughs> the assigned commissioner is Catherine Sandoval. She's one of the very top ranking uh, public utility commissioners. She's coming, and I think they're going to do a drive around our, our fire areas that were damaged. From what I understand, they're doing Say again, what that was rural <laughs> call completion. Rural must be call an emergency notification. Can anybody help me with that? Yeah, at one time they were talking about. Um, discontinuing That's exactly what landmines. Oh, I can ask. Discontinuing what? Landmines? Actually, I can, I can address that. Oh. Oh. Yes, there was a um, <laughs> AT and T who, who did an outstanding job for us here, but they came before us to try to get support from the board of supervisors to for the discontinuance of landmines. Uh, it was a 5-0 vote. Absolutely, positively, 100% no. We rely on landlines here. There's so much of this county, and especially in our district, that just flat doesn't get cell service. And 
they were saying only 7% of the people in California use landlines. I said, well, about 98.9% .9 use them here. So they didn't get any support here. But um, apparently this is not over. Obviously, Lake County was not going to sway the vote for the PUC. Well, so what, what does this mean? I'm sorry, Larry. Tomorrow, yeah, it's tomorrow. tomorrow night at our Twin Pine Casino, uh, Casino Event Center. What time? 5 p.m. or 8 p.m. I do just want to follow up on exactly what you're talking about, Jim. I think it's very important to me because I think they had some bills, some other things are trying to get passed uh, without our knowledge. So it would be a good meeting for you, for Jim to be at. After I see myself uh, in Monica. After I leave Lower Lake, I'll come to the yeah. Yeah, Lower Lake for so what? The homecoming stuff, right, or something. Mm -hmm. What was it again? Rural call completion. completion. They want to switch them to digital. Instead of having a landline like we're used to, they want to change it to digital. Oh, wireless. Well, digital is oh, different, wireless. though. Than, you can still have a landline and have digital. Yeah, that's so right. that's not the same thing. They want to be totally wireless. No, that's cheaper. And I understand that, but here's your for Well, uh, since, since somebody else brought that I don't have any dog in fight other than I just moved into my new house and I'm trying to get internet. Mm. And they say uh, my neighbor has internet uh, and uh, DSL. They say, oh, I'm sorry, we don't have that available. We don't have that. I said, well, wait a minute. We got all brand new lines, and my neighbor has it. He said, well, it's not available. So AT&T guy said, call Pacific Internet, and you can get it. I said, how can I get it to Pacific Internet if AT&T doesn't have it? They said, because. Pacific Internet has a contract with AT&T. They have to give it to them. Yeah. So I called Pacific Internet and I had it in one day. Yeah. What? Do you have the phone yeah. number for that? One day. <laughs> yeah. Pacific the Internet. Phone number so I can call them. Yeah. Maybe so, go tomorrow night. So anyway, uh, uh, I'll definitely be at that meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Larry, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of before it burned down. Anything else back there? Any public comment coming over on this side? Public comment coming back this way? Yes, ma'am. Go. Go ahead, ma'am. My name's Elizabeth Montgomery. I live in Hidden Valley Lake. And I want to mention briefly that if we're going to call HBL Watershed that I belong to, is circulating a petition. And I'd like to read it to you. So I'll save HBL Lake petition to the Lake, Lake County Planning Commission. The Lake and Hidden Valley Lake is being threatened by the proposed Wild Diamond Vineyards project. Geologist David P. Adam has written, quote, the water that feeds the springs and sustains our lake comes from the same volcanic aquifer that Wild Diamond Vineyards plans to exploit. They assert that there will be no significant impact as a result of their pumping activities. But they have not demonstrated that to be true. An actual study that directly addresses the Hidden Valley Lake watershed and the underlying aquifer is needed before heavy pumping is permitted." End quote. Putting it more baldly, he says, quote, we do not want Hidden Valley Lake to disappear or be reduced to a mud hole. End quote. We, the undersigned, strongly urge the Lake County Planning Commission to order the complete hydrology study Dr. Adam has recommended to be conducted before the project is approved. Let me say that uh, Dr. Adam is a geologist with 25 years experience at the U.S. Geological Survey. He has 40 years experience studying Lake County geology. He's a former college professor and the current director of the Clear Lake Environmental Research Center. He's not a Johnny come lately. He is not an alarmist. He is not a nervous Nelly. Let me also say that this is not just a matter that concerns Hidden Valley Lake. Many of the concerns Hidden Valley Lake residents have raised about the Alpine vineyard, vineyard are also countywide issues, and um, in fact, they are regional issues. Um, the, the environment needs to be considered, residents need to be considered as vineyard development proceeds, and we need to be considered as wine tourism development proceeds. And we need to be genuinely considered, not just given opportunities to vent. 
Um, HBL Watershed has collected over 400 signatures so far on this petition. It's like falling off a log. We have a lot of support in our community. Um, you can find the petition and additional information online at our website, which is hblwatershed.org. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. I just wanted to let everybody know that we have our neighborhood watch signs up in the Middletown area now to all the arteries that come into Middletown. Thanks to my husband and my son and myself, we did them and put them up on the And thanks to the um, Lake County Rising, which is the wine industry. Somebody had their hand up back there. Uh, were you late coming in back to that? <laughs> My name is Beth Rudiger. Among other things, I run the Middletown Luncheon Club. And I wanted to let you know that this month's Luncheon Club is similar to this in that we're going to be um, having a forum for the school board candidates. So, And we will be doing supervisor candidates in October, but this month, September, is school board. So if you want to get to know the people who are running for school board, um, you just need to make a reservation with the Luncheon Club because they just don't have to sell out. And if it's all right, I brought a little sign in. sign in so you can put two things. You can put, if you're interested in coming in September, um, please put your email. And also, if you'd like to be on our email list so that you know what's coming up. The Middletown Luncheon Club's been around since 1929. Mm -hmm. And um, we meet on the third Wednesday of every month at the Senior Center here for a delicious, delicious lunch for only five bucks and a speaker. So, um, you, don't I, look, you don't look that old. I know. Yeah. I've been doing this a long time. Jazzercise. Jazzercise. If, you, if you're going to go to that, please sign up because they need to know how to plan for the lunches. Right. We do need reservations. So I'll send okay, thanks, Thank you. Pat. Yes, sir, Mr. Darms. Uh, Tom Darms here. I just want to add what Linda was saying. I wanted to thank the landowners that we put the stakes in for the sign because Caltrans wouldn't allow us to put them on the highway, so we had to put them over the fence, which was kind of fun sometimes, but we did it. I just wanted to thank the landowners. Okay. Uh, oh, you came in late. Lisa came in late, so oh. we're going <laughs> to... Uh, I wanted to invite everybody to Ashes to Art, an exhibition and concert happening this Friday from 5.30 to 8.30 to commemorate the anniversary of the Valley Fire. Uh, there's new sculptures happening on the corner, there's new artwork inside, and there's gonna be a, a whole lot of wonderful performances by uh, local artists, uh, musicians, and poets. And I really encourage everybody to come for a little bit or for the whole time, 5.30 to uh, 8.30 this Saturday, October 10th. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement about the brick, the brick hall in Lower Lake. Uh, they are currently serving lunch, or uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner to the fire survivors to the community there. And I know that they put out an outreach uh, asking for help and assistance. I've seen things posted on Facebook, and I just wanted to let everybody know that if you are interested or you know somebody that's interested in helping, they're short during the lunch hour. Because as I mentioned to them, that for folks down here in the south, the south end of the county to drive up there and find out that there's already plenty of help is um, you know, kind of a, a waste of time and effort. But lunchtime is a uh, time of beat up there. So if you know anyone, is it daily? daily? It is daily through September 22nd. Any, September 22nd is the last day. Thank you, Monica. Any other public comment? Yeah. Oh, last one. Um, Sunday, September 11th from noon to 5, we are doing... You know, our anniversary, you know, not anniversary, or, you know, um, memorial, obviously, of the fire. We're not doing it on Monday. We're doing it on the 11th. It's from 12 to 5, free food, music. We just want to get the community together out at the event center. And um, please come out and, uh, you know, have a meal. Talk about the recovery process and everything you've been going through. We're having that, that and that is this Sunday. And also tomorrow at 10 a.m. is the TLC meeting in the event center for the long-term recovery group. Um, once again, so those are my two announcements. Okay, you're okay. Okay, now I'm going to close the public comment, and we're going to bring it back to the uh, to the board and welcome everyone to uh, to uh, this meet and greet, meet the candidates, talk to them, 
We're not going to call it a debate, so it's not a debate. It, it's a time for you to meet the candidates and to ask them questions and so on. Um, the rules are going to be that um, they will make an opening statement for five minutes. If they want to use five minutes, they can use five minutes. After both of them speak, then we'll open it to questions and and Claude will be out and he'll, he'll if you raise your hand and want a question, he'll point you out and say this gentleman or this lady has a question. Now, this is a question and answer period. This is not a place for you to ask a question and then they may give you an answer and you don't like it and you want to argue with it. That's not what this is about. So don't make me tell you to sit down and shut up. You know, because I will. You know me. I'm politically, totally politically incorrect. So, so we want to get the questions asked very quickly, and we're going to give them a minute to answer. Now, the reason we want to put time limits on it, we want to give everybody a chance uh, to ask their questions to both candidates. If we get in long-winded discussions, we won't have that much time, and we want to give everyone plenty of time. Okay, so you understand, uh, we, we've drawn numbers, and Mocha's going to open, and then Monica will go, and at the end, at the closing, Monica will go first, and, and Mocha will go second. Uh, we're fortunate. We're fortunate here in Middletown to have two great candidates. And I feel, I feel honored to host this because we do have such good candidates. Both of them have proven their, their loyalty and their concern for Middletown and Lake County. So we've been blessed by having two good candidates, regardless of whether you love one and hate the other. I don't think they should come into it. But we, we, we were fortunate to have two wonderful people that want to serve us. So with that, I will introduce to you first uh, Monica Rosenthal. She works oh, her husband. No, no, I know. Most parts of it. Everyone take a deep breath. Uh, Monica Rosenthal and her husband live out on, off of Dry Creek. They were my neighbors for six years and uh, I know them very well. And then uh, the other candidate is Moak, or Jose Moak Simon, who's been here since grass started to grow <laughs> in, in, in the valley. So we're, we're fortunate to have both of them here. Moak is going to open, so I'm gonna turn it over to Moak. And at uh, four minutes and 30 seconds, if he's still talking, we'll give him a yellow sign, and at five minutes, we'll give him the red, and then he'll know his time's up. Okay, Moke, it's all yours, bud. Thank you, Fletcher. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'll just go right into it, start uh, from my history for everybody. Maybe somebody doesn't know. Um, my name is Jose Moke Simon III. Um, I was born and raised here. I was born in Redbud Hospital. I've lived on the Middletown Rancheria my entire life. I went to Mini Cannon. I also went to Middletown High School. I was lucky enough to um, have some great teachers there and one heck of a football coach. So I um, played football and baseball here, and I went on and um, had a college career as far as um, football goes. I was lucky enough to be picked up and um, as a free agent, got a little time in the NFL, and I played in the World Football League and the Arena Football League. So it's been a, you know, that was a great part of my life. When I was done playing in 1996, I came back to the Rancheria and back to Middletown and I was asked to become the tribal chairman of the Middletown Rancheria. I was the youngest chairman ever in our tribe's history. Uh, it was um, you know, a very humbling time, but it was hard work. So um, I took over in 19, um, about 1997, and I've pretty much been the chairman um, that entire time. If, as, as it goes from the tribal side, we have a lot of government programs that we work with. Um, we are a small government in our own. We have an EPA grant, we have roads, we have um, public utilities, we have um, ICWA, or Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, we have a 638 contract that allows us to operate, and we also have a couple of businesses at this time. We have the Twin Pine Casino and Hotel that was opened in 1994. Uh, we've done three expansions. We started in modulars, 
We go into the tent, the event center that you've seen, and then we also we did a $50 million expansion um, in 2009 and opened up 60 hotel rooms with a 25,000 square foot facility with a couple of restaurants, one restaurant and two bars uh, in the facility. We also own the Mount St. Helena Brewing Company. We purchased that, that building and that property in 2002, and we have 13 employees there. We're open seven days a week, and uh, we produce our own beer that we use at the casino, and we also distribute to other small businesses here in the county. As far as District 1 supervisor, um, you know, I threw my hat into the ring because I see the critical times that we're going to be going through here as a county. You know, the Valley Fire was something devastating. It affected me, you know, physically and emotionally. Um, I had family members that lost their homes. We had 43 people that lost their homes in our business, and we're still working to recover from that. And then we're hit with the Clayton Fire. So we've got a lot of work here in our district that needs to be done. It, my number one focus would be fire recovery, economic development, uh, not only for our district, but also the entire county. Obviously the lake, I believe you have a healthy lake, we have a healthy economy, and that's something we need to focus on as an entire uh, county um, as a whole. I can work with almost anybody. I've had lots of workings with both the county government, uh, Ed Roby, uh, the previous supervisor, Jim Comstock, I've called on him on a few different situations that we've had with the county. But I make sure that um, I can really coordinate any problems that we have, communicate with individuals, both at the county level. I think from a tribal standpoint, what I bring to the table as a leader here in District 1 is the ability to not only work with local government, but also state and federal governments. I've done that and had that experience over the last 20 years, working on passing laws, ordinances, you know, um, you know, and everything that we do as a, as a tribal operation. I've made contacts across the country, both at the state and the federal level, and I really pride myself on doing what I say I'm going to do. You know, I am kind of a man of my word. What you see is what you get with me. I'm open and honest. You might not like to hear what I have to say, but I'll do my best to stay on track. If I don't know something, I'll do my best to get an answer for you. If it's asked and I don't have the answer for it, I will come back to you with some type of an answer. This community as a whole, I love it. You guys have heard me say that before. I've stood out on these steps and said, we are going to build back. And we have started on that process. You know, my daughter, I can probably say right down here on Douglas Street, with the help of the county, you know, going through the building department, individuals in this room just asking questions, she's back in her home. It happened in June. Was not expecting to do that, but it, it's done. And I understand the frustration of the people trying to rebuild here in the county, and I think it needs to be streamlined, and those are things that we can work on. I got the 30 second there. I can't keep talking. Hopefully a lot of good questions will come my way. I will be available afterwards, and um, I will try and field every question that I can. So thank you very much, and I appreciate you for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, thank you, Matt, for, for hosting this, this forum. So I would just start off honestly and, and, and tell you that this is the part of the forum that is not real comfortable for me. Um, I'm not real good at promoting myself. Um, I am really good at promoting other ideas and standing behind projects and, and uh, the, dealing with the issues that we have. But um, so please bear with me. So I, unlike Moak, who just kind of froze, flows freely, I do have my notes here that I will refer to every once in a while. But anyway, I, and to that point, I'm not a show horse. I am a workhorse. And um, I take a stand on issues. I answer emails. I'm responsive. I, um, I'm involved in the community. And I will go to bat, and I have gone to bat. I have a, a proven track record of showing I go to bat for uh, District 1 and, and for various different issues here within the county. Um, my priorities, um, sorry, you know, this, this is the point here where Moke and I basically are in alignment. Uh, you know, first and foremost, it's, it's the recovery here from, from the fires. And now, of course, we have the Clayton fire as well. And again, to the, anyone here in the room that has lost their home or lost their animals or, you know, has lost momentos, mementos of uh, their past and their history, my, you know, my heart goes out to you. And then my neighbors are dealing with rebuilding. Um, many of them lost their homes. Um, I live on a 20-acre property that was, uh, uh, fortunately, had a lot of, has a lot of defensible space around it. Uh, I did the fire burnt through the wildlife corridors. 
Um, my husband actually was able to kind of get a handle on that and stop that. We have a, uh, a diesel pump on site, so he was able to turn that on and, and turn on overhead sprinklers, which kind of stopped it on that end. Um, so we're really, you know, um, glad that that well, so many people played a role in stopping it in different areas. Anyway, so again, uh, much like Mo said, my priorities are that fire recovery, a uh, stronger economy, and a stronger economy is on a number of different levels as far as we need um, infrastructure, number one. Uh, that has been uh, just kind of overlooked in the past. Um, so, and, and not, you know, not at anybody's fault or anything, but it's just that we need to get back into providing infrastructure. That's part of our economy, part of our tourism, part of increasing our tourism, our tourism as well. Um, we need jobs and we need skilled labor to help provide jobs for those businesses that may come here, that, that we want to bring here to the area. We need a healthier Lake County. And as Moke touched on, we need the, the lake. We need to be working on the lake. I know that there's a, a lot of work going on right now with the Middle, uh, the Middle Creek Restoration Project, and I would support that. I also support a healthier um, Lake County people, as well as our lake and our area. Um, so, and that also kind of comes right in, into play with a healthier economy, um, healthier people. It just, it all works together. So, and then also in the preservation of the quality of life. Um, a little different for me, is in my background, I was not born and raised here. I actually uh, was born in Hawaii. I was raised on the East Coast, mostly by my mother. Uh, when my father was serving in the military and served in Vietnam. Um, we moved actually until I was about 10 years old. I moved every single year of my life, and going to a lot of different places, meeting a lot of different people, um, you know, living in a lot of different areas. Um, for me, the, uh, you know, the diversity of, of what I experienced in my life, the diversity of the people, you know, I'll just tell you quickly, as far as my first boyfriend, you know, was six foot tall, was a basketball player, and had a, you know, a big old afro. My second boyfriend was, you know, tie-dye, uh, you know, or my second most favorite boyfriend was, you know, <laughs> was kind of a tie-dye guy. And uh, he probably, actually, in those days, he probably smoked too much weed. And he was a bad, he was an awful Catholic. Um, so, and my husband, now Dave, uh, that Fletcher had shared with you that we live off of Dry Creek. My husband is a winemaker and a farmer. And I met him in, actually, when I was living in Sonoma, and he was in Napa. He has uh, some roots here, as far as his family had bought the property that we help manage now. Um, he bought that property in, um, the family bought it in, in the 70s. So we have been here farming and working in the area when the pizza place was actually Jim's Pizza on the corner. Um, we've been coming here to the area. I've been part of this area. Again, I've moved every single year of my life. I've never lived longer than five years in one place. I came to Lake County. I fell in love with it. I've been here for 23 years. I care about this county. That's why I'm running for supervisor. Thank you. The, uh, the candidates for the opening statements. Uh, if, if you have a question for one of them, please indicate who, who you want the question to go to, and Claude will uh, recognize you, and he's going to do all that. Then you ask the question, and then they will give you their answer, and then we'll go to the next person. Okay, Claude, you're in charge, but anybody want to ask a question? For Mark. Yes. Do you see any conflict of interest between your tribal chair position and uh, county supervisor? Stand up, that's on. No, I don't see any conflict of interest. Um, you know, I think over my past 20 years, as far as being a tribal leader, I think things that have gone to the Board of Supervisors, one was hooking up a sewer district, the other one was working with them to do a turn lane. There are some small issues um, that we had to deal with at that point. Those are all done with. As far as a conflict of interest, if there was anything that would come up, I would do just like any of the other supervisors do and recuse myself from any of the discussions that might be happening. That minute goes by very quick. So I would say no. I would be the district one supervisor, and that's what I would work as. Oh, that was 30 seconds? Okay, sorry about that. 
from a tribal standpoint, as far as my job goes, I am backed up by a tribal council. There are five of us. My vice chair, Sally, sits here very well. They were picking up all the slack or any of the slack that needs to be done from my job at this point as far as the tribal chairman. So as far as a conflict of interest, I don't see any. <laughs> I led uh, two separate marijuana campaigns, uh, the, and basically that was to put Measure N, or what's known now as Article 72, to keep that on the books, and, um, and then I also led the campaign to oppose Measure O and P, um, and the primary purpose for that was basically to safeguard the, the safety of the community and to keep marijuana grows out of our community growth areas and away from our schools and to make it safe for, for seniors. So there's, that's one example. Oh, am I, should I do more? No, you have more. <laughs> so the other, I worked on the Save the Lake campaign also. So on uh, two of those Save, lake, the, the Save the Lake campaigns. Um, so what else have I done? Oh, recently, uh, the Dollar General store. So I've been there very actively engaged in uh, the Dollar General. Thank you. May I say something? No. Would it be better for you guys if I just 15. did read when it's the end? Yeah, that worked for me. Yeah, or 15 Sorry seconds, because then it's like really yeah, close. Yeah, you said 30, I thought it was... Yeah, about I know. And yeah. I know. Yeah. Sorry well, about that. 30 is half of the minute. Yeah. So it becomes the... So do you want just read when you're done? Yeah, okay. that'll work for me. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes. Yes. You mentioned that you work to pass laws and ordinances, so you have experience. Do you have any idea of any laws or ordinances that you well, I know one that is very important. You know, uh, Monica touched on it. The marijuana ordinance that's going to be done over here that will be presented here in the, in the next um, couple of months. Very important. You know, I, it's it's polling right now that uh, that's probably going to pass. I think about 75 percent for basically. Um, you know, legalization of marijuana for 18 and over, 21 and over. So I think it's very important uh, for all of our communities here that that ordinance gets done before the law passes. I don't know if that's going to happen. I think we're behind the eight ball a little bit, but there are quite a few meetings that I will be attending and I have already attended um, that to help get that done because it's very important where they're growing these things, who's doing it, how we're going to regulate the licensing process. And I think I provide somewhat of a unique experience because I think right now where we're at as far as the county is the same position we were before I negotiated the compact with the tribes in the state of California because now we've got to go through the regulatory regulatory process of licensing the vendors who's working in these businesses and all those types of things and I think we'll I bring that aspect to it thank you sure. um, it's kind of for both of you um, I grew up in the Napa Valley and I saw the valley places where I used to go fishing in Santa Lina's gone. It's dry. None of the wineries, none of the businesses say it's their fault. Everybody says it's not me. But the creeks and rivers are gone. I mean, I'd like to see the growth, but uh, is there a plan to make sure that we have water? Because I live right off the San Juan Creek, and if it goes dry, I'm, I'm done. I got nothing. But yeah, so to, to that, I um, agree that, you know, I think we can learn. I actually lived in Napa um, for a while, and Napa went a little overboard. They actually put together a, uh, an ordinance basically saying uh, that it, there would be no conversion of agriculture uh, except by a vote of the people. And so that made it very difficult, and of course, the wine, the wine industry really went robust. Um, you know, it's working well for their economy, but you're right. You know, it, it was kind of out of balance. Um, with the with the environment, and again, we have such a precious and unique place here. I think it, it, you know, in every aspect, it needs to stay in balance. Whether we're talking about casinos, or we're talking about vineyard development, or we're talking about housing development, or commercial, you know, we we need a balance. So between all of that, I think Monica answered that very well. Um, but you know, I, I think what needs to be done is the community needs to be involved as much as possible. As you know, 
from the tribal side. I hate going back to that, but with all of our departments and when we are doing our expansions and our growth, those are always things that we're looking at. How are we going to get our water? Where are we coming with our future water? And that is something we're working on right now. So I think there definitely needs to be a plan moving forward for the next District 1 supervisor in our area of how much growth that is for the, for the vineyards in the industry because it is. A lot of the vineyards that are around here, which I just asked some questions here not long ago on uh, another group I had to meet with, is most of, the vine most of the grapes that are grown here, a lot of them are shipped down to Napa. So we are running into that problem where the water is being used here out of our county, and then that product is leaving, and we're not benefiting from it. So I think it definitely needs to be talked with, with the wine associations and how we move forward with the agricultural growth here in District 1 and the entire county. Because if we, we let it happen, which we've seen it happen, it, it'll just keep growing exponentially, and then we are going to have a serious problem with the water. Do I have any time left? And it is about economic growth, getting more businesses in the area, but more appropriate businesses, ones that will benefit the community, more than having stores that children want to run across Highway 29 to. Um, and I just like your view on that point. Over here. No, you can go first on this one. We'll, we'll, let's switch back and forth. Um, you know, from my point of view, and I know what you're talking about, run across the street, um, you know, and, and you guys know my position on that, you know, um, as far as uh, that Dollar General went, they met the requirements, they did those things, it's something the District 1 Supervisor and I think our leaders need to do to work with that group if it comes in. As far as other businesses that need to be done, um, I don't know that there's a bunch knocking down the door right now, but we really need to sit down and get a plan together. Not only development of businesses and economic development that are coming in, but also the housing growth and other things that are going to be happening here in the near future. And where we're going to put that growth and opportunities that are going to be coming down the line. Because developers do see it as a point right now to move into our area, you know, to develop more housing, you know, maybe it's even you know, a bunch of houses all together, a big, which is very scary. So. Um, as far as economic development, I, I can speak directly. What we need here is more jobs, um, but it needs to be done directly. When the individuals want to come in, they need to be worked with. They need to come to this forum and talk with individuals of the community and see if it's going to fit in with us. Okay, so um, again, I was planning commissioner for uh, several years back, and in the process, I uh, became very well acquainted with our, our general plan and our area plan. And we do have, have those, that plan laid out. We have that information there. We need to, to read that plan and we need to actually put into effect what's there. And of course, if that plan needs to be changed, then, then we work at updating and the general plan can be amended. Uh, the area plan could be amended, but you know, it's, a, it's all within a process. The store that you're speaking of, you know, yes, is that, is that the right location? You know, yeah, probably not. <laughs> so, and it doesn't really fit, and that process is not quite over yet. Um, you know, in, in trying to make sure that that doesn't fit, in fact, fit in that location, um, according to the area plan and the general plan, uh, that design needs to comply with those, uh, with those area plans that were developed by the people. So, um, and I'd say you'll find my name on the general plan. Um, I serve as planning commissioner. That's what I was involved with the creation of the area plan as well. Did I ignore that? I'm sorry. <laughs> I want my I'm wondering if either of the candidates would be willing to sign my petition. Now, are you going to ask the question? That's, well, that's that was not a, a question. question I that was a question. <laughs> do that afterwards. Please. Would either of the candidates be willing to sign my petition? Question <laughs> mark. <laughs> what she talked about was the wild diamond vineyard, which is, which is going to affect Hidden Valley Lake. And I was interested to know at this point if either one of you had an opinion on that. Oh, my turn to go first. <laughs> so I, um, well, I guess I do have an opinion. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased with the process that that, that that particular project is going through. Elizabeth Montgomery and a couple of others that were working, um, that had questions about that project when it first came up in the vineyard several, a couple of years ago now. So when they were expanding their planting, 
um, I talked to them, you know, and told them kind of the process and what they what they should should be. And at that time, I think you would agree, Elizabeth. You didn't know that I actually owned a vineyard, because first and foremost, I'm about good projects. So, and and being a member of the wine in industry, I want to make sure that the wine industry also we don't have black eyes out there. So, so for for whether it's a vineyard project or it's any other project, yet yes, we need to look at it. They are going through an EIR process that is in the works. I think the process is working. There is room for public um, input. We need to, again be engaged, read the material, and and have your say. So, do you yourself have an opinion at this point? I do not. Wait, 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 wait. Part of my question. No, the, 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 you get one question. No. I'm going to answer. No, but she did. She we'll, have, like, we'll have a chance to come back through. You can. My time ran out. We have been involved as a tribe with the Wild Diamond Project. Um, so, just as the other thing, it is agricultural land. As long as they meet the requirements and they have the opportunity to expand reasonably and, and by the rules and they make sure that they are not hurting the environment, which I think they're going down that path at this point. I know some people aren't happy where it is and where it's located, but I think, you know, I've seen some, you know, and had some conversations with some of the older folks. There's a lot of agricultural land in here. I think there was some agricultural land before the Hidden Valley Project was ever put in there, and now it's surrounding it. So it needs to be done responsibly and by the rules and regulations that are put in place right now. And like I said earlier, there always needs to be balance. I know the casinos come up a little bit. The one thing with casinos in this county, just for information, you can only put a tribal casino on your tribal land. So at the most casinos you'd ever have, if it happened, would be seven in this county. And it's probably not going to happen because there's not enough people. There's only 70,000 people. So thank you. One minute. Mike, so I think we both qualify to assume leadership role in the county. I'm curious about role models who inform your leadership styles. I mean, this could be a name that everyone in the room recognizes, or someone more personal. My turn. Role model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> role model for myself. No, that's very easy. Sitting in the room, my father. The reason one of one of the hardest working tribal members in our tribe when I was young. Uh, there was a lot of. There was only seven homes on the reservation. It's not like it is now. Everybody thinks, you know, the tribe were millionaires and that stuff. That isn't the way it is. When we grew up, all we had was each other out on the rancheria. My father worked all his life. He built a lot of these vineyards, a lot of the dams that you see around here. He worked hard on heavy equipment for a lot of people in the area. And he did that. And my mother also worked at Langtree, did things. She worked harder than some of the men that I know today. So. Uh, my father being my number one role model, and mom, your number two. I apologize. <laughs> I didn't score a touchdown, so I can't say good job, mom. So, um, no, and that's it. So. <laughs> so, so, role model. I don't know, man. It's really hard to narrow that down to, to one role model. model. Um, you know, I mean, there's teachers in my past that, you know, I've, you know, taken things from that, you know, I, they have stuck with me throughout my entire life. Uh, there's, there's my mother um, that, you know, I think she's the sweetest person and the most forgiving and the most compassionate and the most, uh, I grew up in a house as far as that the door was always open. I, I, you know, I gotta tell you, it's hard. We have exes and, you know, everybody's at the house at big parties and stuff. It's like, who, how are they all related and stuff? But it's like, once you're in the family, the door's always open and they're always there. Um, you know, so that's something that I really take, you know. Um, but then for, you know, it's a, people who, who really, you know, set a goal and, and commit themselves to that goal and, um, and are fearless in, in some regards, not, not oblivious uh, to everything that's going around them and all, but fearless. Uh, I would say that that's you know, kind of the, my strongest, uh, the best models I, I follow. Thank you. But both of you talked about the importance of economic development, but I'm wondering about not just the uh, constricting what can come into the county, but also promoting the county uh, to bring new options so that instead of having to choose do we want this or do we not want this, we can have a variety of choices. So I'm wondering what, what will you do, what can you do in order to put more choices in the hopper for us to choose from? I totally agree with you. 
So I think that we need to be more proactive in uh, going out and taking taking a look at, at what businesses you know could could be here and could operate. And I'll give you a couple of examples of. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody knows Parker Plastics. That's up off of Highway 29. Small business operates, you know, there very quietly and stuff. They have a small, uh, basically, they have UPS truck deliveries in and out. So it works really, really well for them here in the area. They pay well. They have about 40, 45 employees. We also have Reynolds Company here. Again, you know, a distributor of small items uh, that that doesn't take a big semi truck to come in and deliver and, and exit with goods, uh, but with, with smaller trucks. Again, uh, employing about 40, 45 people, paying well, good benefits. Um, that's the kind of business that we need and we need to go after. I know my son, for instance, is currently working for, for a small company building drones. There's no reason why that company couldn't be here. So again, small pieces, small company, um, little impact on, on the area. From my point of view with economic development, I always try to you know, think outside of the box. And um, what I think we need to do, obviously, number one, is figure out how we're going to market ourselves to these businesses. And that's a big point. I'm always frustrated. We're in the marketing business as far as Twin Pine Casino, and we market all the time. We, we have people that come up Thursday through Sunday, all the way from, you know, we get them from all of Orange County, LA. We know where these people are coming from. We market by Facebook and all these other things, but we have a story to tell. And I think what we need to do is really sit down with the tourism folks here in Lake County and come up with a commercial, some opportunities, and really put a highlight on what we have to offer here as a county. I think beyond that, I think we need to reach outside of the county and really get some help from the state officials. Go to the state of California, go up to the governor's office and say, hey, listen, we're the poorest county west of the Mississippi, I've heard, you know, as far as that goes. And there needs to be a focus on this because what you need to do is that put a plan together for economic development. If somebody wants to come into the state, we have an ability to have, say, on the north side of the lake or here, some space that they come in from large manufacturing. We need to look at those things and we need to come up with a plan. Like, you know, she said, we need to be fearless. Being told told no is not a bad thing. Red. You need to keep asking. Sorry. No. <laughs> I apologize. Big red flag, no. Big red, no. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a question for both of you. If you had to name one thing that was your priority, uh, whether it be environmental or, or growth or business or uh, development or, or what, does either one of you have one thing that would you would consider more of a priority? Yeah, I, I got one. Easy. Obviously, fire recovery and housing. Housing is a huge thing that we're dealing with right, right now. It was 1,300 home burns burned. About 550 were renters. So I think converting renters into homeowners needs to be a huge focus as we move forward here. I'm a business owner, Mount St. Helena Brewing Company. I also own a small HVAC company I started a year ago with my brother, my ex-brother-in-law, Arrowhead Eating and Cooling. We have two employees. We need more people in homes who are homeowners so they can invest in the community, have their kids here, go to our businesses, and help with the economic development. So turning renters into homeowners who were burned out here in the Valley Fire is very important. And I think housing would be my number one thing for our area here. It kind of works together because um, I would say economic development. So, because we get a handle on our economic development and enrich the community, the housing is going to follow. So, and, and I totally agree that that's a that's a big issue as far as it definitely, uh, um, you know, our homeless community that seems to be increasing. You know, again, it all kind of stems from if we can improve our economy, then everything else will will follow. So, thank you. Can you share with us who would be on your short list for planning commissioner? Should you be elected? Um, I have no list at this point in time. I, to be honest, I have not even thought about that. I'm, uh, you know, set my sights on on the election, November eighth, and then from there I would I would go with um, with planning commissioner. I think that Joe Sullivan, who's sitting here, is our current planning commissioner. I think he's been doing an awesome job. So, and um, if I were to be elected uh, as your next supervisor, I, mean, I hope Joe and I can talk. And, so, but I really haven't given that a whole lot of thought, to be honest. As far as the planning commissioner going, putting a list together, no, but I have been approached. I think I've been approached by um, 
an individual that I hold highly in this community. Uh, you know, and um, do you want to know the name? I'll give you the name or not? I have one person that has approached me. Um, and and what I would do obviously is let the process sit down and understand exactly um, what they want to do for our county and how they're going to help us. So at this point, I haven't you know really made up my mind or even put too much thought into it, but I have been asked by an individual. Well, so we've touched on development in terms of marijuana, in terms of agriculture, and in terms of other means of economic development. We've also touched on the fact that we have a Middletown area plan that most of us know a lot of money and time is spent on. How would you combine the need for growth that has certain parameters and the Middletown area plan and make it actually be something that we can stick to? What would your next step be? So yeah, I see the puzzled look. Okay, so because 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 these these issues keep coming up, like does the store belong here? Does this vineyard belong here? As soon as there's pot, do these growers belong here? And in all of these cases, we're looking at the impact on our residents, the impact on our natural resources, and what the benefits are to our community. So. The Middletown area plan was designed to create a vision for the future. She had the question, but she got puzzled looks yeah, from yeah. us. So. Yeah, so I'm trying, I'm trying to give you the question. So how would you work with, like, what would you do? Would you create a plan that would work that could be overarching? And what might that look like? Because there's a lot of great ideas, but the question is how do we actually implement them? Because the Middletown area plan is a brilliant document, perhaps with some missing pieces. So how do we make those missing pieces fall into place? Your turn. Right. <laughs> well, you know, I think you stated there, there, there is a plan. Now, does a plan satisfy everybody? No, it's not. I think there's, you know, somewhere in the area of 7,000 people here, maybe a little less, 6,000 in Middletown, Hidden Valley, and it's just somewhere in that area. Um, you know, we heard from quite a few people here at the math town hall, those types of things. It really is just getting the community out, I think, to talk about the issues as they move forward. If they meet the requirements, it is really tough to just ban somebody because I, I don't like them. You know, I think, you know, Governor Gavin Newsom says, you know, prohibition doesn't work. Just banning something because you don't like it, you gotta talk through the process. I don't think there's an overreaching plan that is gonna satisfy everybody and say, that's perfect, that's how we're gonna move forward. Um, I think we try and stick to what we have in place, modify if it, if it needs to be. But as long as they're meeting the requirements and those types of things, you're just going to have to try and work together as a community as a whole, whether it's a 50-50 split or not, and just move forward with things and hopefully make it positive for the community. So, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so to answer your question, uh, there is a process for, for different projects that's a pre-application process that sometimes the developer, and, and I'll give a, an example, Ken Porter with the Valley Oaks uh, project, he didn't do it actually through the county, he actually held community meetings about his project out in the community before he moved forward with creating the plan. Uh, so there was lots of community input and his plan he changed his plan before he presented it in front of the, the planning commission through all that community input. There's another way in the county, there's a pre-application process where some, uh, some processes or some projects go and they sit at a table basically and there's various different people at that table that you know would have a say, you know, have a meaningful say about the project and take care of some of those issues before the one that you're speaking of, you know, just kind of balloons on, on the people. But then the other piece that's missing here is the zoning ordinance. So we have the zoning ordinance in place. That has the tools to implement the, the area plan and the general plan. That needs to be updated. Yes, for both of you. What are your thoughts on ways to improve public safety and law enforcement in Lake County? Good question. Um, can you say that again? Yeah, I'm improve? sorry. What, what are your thoughts on ways to improve public, public safety and law enforcement in Lake County? Public safety and law enforcement. Well, one of them is is that you know going back to jobs and job retention, um, you know, and paying well so that we you know can attract you know good uh, law enforcement officers that so here in the area. But then it's also giving them the tools to operate. So, for instance, again, you know, it's one of the reasons why I got behind working on 
the two measures on the uh, marijuana measures was in order to give our law enforcement the tools to to keep some to keep community safe. So you know, so it's you know it's working through law enforcement. You know, basically working with Brian Martin. Um, you know, in developing the staff, which I think that the, he's made some really good changes here recently. So I know that the board of supervisors approved a, a raise. Um, so and there has been some more atten uh, retention. Of, of law enforcement officers. So I think we need to keep going in that path. And again, it goes back to economy. We need the money in order to be able to pay. So, so it, you know, again, there's many pieces to the puzzle that need to work together. I think Monica touched on it uh, a little bit here. The, but my thoughts are, uh, as far as the marijuana industry, if it is approved in November, and what we have in place now, the taxes that are derived from that, I really think we need to fight as hard as we can to make sure that that money is moved into and put towards law enforcement, not only with helping combat, you know, what's going to be happening here as far as the growth, you know, the growing, you know, the regulation of it, but also um, being able to make sure that we take care of our, our law enforcement. And I think those taxes should be allocated towards um, law enforcement. I really do. There's going to be a lot of taxes that come in from it. If you look at what's happening in Colorado and some of the other states that are done, you know, I think that really needs to be a focus as we move forward with this um, new industry that is coming. And it is going to be large, and it is going to come very fast, folks. Uh, so we need to be prepared for that. So taxation on the marijuana, I think, is very important. And that's what we have to do because our budgets are very tight at this point to be moving things around. Both have been attending the Middletown area town hall meetings for quite some time now, and we're a municipal advisory committee to the Board of Supervisors. And I am curious as to where you see our value in where, if either one of you are elected, how you view that, and and how if you would um, consider the weight of what this body says in whatever the issue is. I think this is a great venue. Um, coming from my tribal background, I'll tell you, we meet with our community every 30 days, just like you guys do, before we make any major decisions moving forward with any expansion projects, as far as little housing, education, anything that we do. And that's something I carry on as a District 1 supervisor, not only having coming to the math meetings, but having meetings in you know, uh, Lower Lake trying to go to Anderson Springs, trying to come here at Middletown, to get out there and really meet with the folks. One thing I don't understand is why there's not a District 1 supervisor office right here in Middletown. So you don't have to wait. So once a week you can come in and talk with me and say, hey, this is my problem. Can you do something for me? And that's something going forward I would do. But as far as math, I think this is a great venue. I think some of the stuff we ran into with Dollar General and those types of things, I think this is a place where it needs to be hashed out. The real questions need to be asked. We need to hold whoever's going to be developing here questions afterwards say, hey, I want to talk to you about what I'm really seeing a vision for our area. So as far as wait for this group, I think it's great. But I think there's a lot more that needs to be done by the supervisor in District 1. Thank you. So, um, so I was actually involved in the formation of, of uh, MAC or, or MAC uh, when, it, when it first started. Martha Webster was with us. And um, I think it, you know, it's gone through many evolutions and ups and downs. And I think Joe can attest to this also. You know, that, I mean, there was a time there were only three or four people here. <laughs> so, so it's really good to see all of you here in the room. Thanks for coming. And, and it's, it's working. It took, it took a while. But, um, but it is working. I think it's a really good representation of the, you know, or an opportunity for people to come and, as Moke said, to kind of hash out you know, some ideas and, and, and share your thoughts and concerns. Um, what I would like to see is a more, I guess, in the, maybe a more formalized uh, um, sharing of information back, back and forth between, between Mac and the supervisor. And perhaps that's with, a, with an office. You know, I'm not, you know, an office would be great, but also if I'm elected supervisor, what I plan to do is actually be active in the community as I am. am I'm going to go to you. I'm going to go to your places and find out and hear from you as opposed to you having come to me. Cal. Thank you. Um, so, if marijuana, when marijuana becomes uh, uh, legal, um, 
Do you, what is your vision and what is your stand on supporting businesses coming from outside to you to, who want to like buy our property up and start growing as opposed to our growers that we already have here and supporting them in their growth and economic flourishing? That's a good point, and uh, you know, for for cannabis growers, it's not just the cannabis growers that are concerned. Agriculture is concerned too, and especially currently, the Article 72 has cannabis growing on on ag land, um, and the agriculture industry is also concerned about then prime ag land going away and becoming you know cannabis farms. So again, we have to find that balance. There are some things in in um, in the works right now to do an overlay zoning. Um, so, but to answer your questions, if our business, you're right. You know, we need to we need to help promote those that are here, those that are doing good business. We have in the in the process right now. There is a hundred permits to be issued. So, and those are, are you know being bought up, if you will, <laughs> you know, by some of our local folks that are staying in tune with what's going on now with the changes to Article 72 and with the taxation. So, um, was I out of time? <laughs> Well, you had like five seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't do red yet. <laughs> I know. Supporting local businesses and growers, I guess, if that's what you're going to say, um, at this point, would always be a focus of um, myself as a district one supervisor. Now, there are going to be a lot of outside entities. There is a lot of money in this business uh, that will be coming to town. So I think the ordinance that is being drafted and will be done by the end of the year, uh, hopefully will help line out a lot of those things and we'll have, like you said, the overlaying maps, where they're going to be available to grow and how it happens. Um, so that process is happening right now, but we always want to do our best to try and encourage our local businesses, which I'm a business owner, you know, that needs to be very important from our supervisors, all five of them setting up there at the county level. So that's my thoughts on it. I have a question for both of you. I happen to be sitting next to Jim Comstock, but it didn't ask me to ask this question. Uh, my experience, my experience from Anderson Springs is all the supervisors are always there, but Jim is there 24 seven. There's not a time that I have ever or anyone at Anderson Springs called him that we, he doesn't know every answer, but he gets back to us and all that. And the idea of like, I know Ed Rohde had an office in town, but I, I would like to know, are you both that same dedication that Jim has to the people in his district? Anybody going to say no? <laughs> My cell phone, I already work 24-7, uh, and, and I really am on call. You know, I've been everywhere in the middle of the night for my tribal members. I, I've gone in the middle of the night, and I've gotten kids back from CPS. I, I've done things, you know, we just finished an adoption today, or yesterday, um, you know, a tribal customary adoption in Napa. So I'm always available 24-7. If something happens on the rancher or somewhere, I'm the guy that calls. Whether it's Hector from the Highway Patrol or it's Brian Martin from the Sheriff's Department, Cal Fire, Mike Wink, anybody else, um, make myself available. My cell phone is all over the place. That is it. That is what I, I live by. I'll do my best to get back by your email or call unless I'm absolutely out of place. But my dedication is to really help as many people as possible. And, you know, hopefully... You know, I can keep proving that and proving that as I move forward. Hopefully I'm elected and I can even prove it more for our, my entire community here as District 1. And if I'm not elected, I'll keep doing the same thing. You know, I love this place and I love the people here. So my cell phone's available. Call. I live right on the Rancheria, too. So just come and see me. I'll do like Jim and Rob have done now through the fire. My cell phone is 355-2762. My cell phone is 355-2762. You can call me anytime now, so whether I'm supervisor or not. But, uh, but yes, my cell phone would always be available. My home phone number, too, 987-2760. Um, you can call me anytime. I have a, a track record, actually, of working hard for the community over the last few years. It's one of the reasons why Rob Brown actually endorsed me. He was one of the first candidate, or the first folks to endorse me. I called him up and said, what do you think about me running for supervisor? He endorsed me because he saw how hard that I was working on a number of different projects, and that's, uh, anyway, a number of different projects. Um, I received the Congressional Awards Woman of the Year in 2015. 
for the same reasons as far as Congressman Thompson acknowledged um, that uh, that the hard work I was doing immediately following the Valley Fire and then connection with uh, Farm Bureau and other organizations I've been a part of. Thank you. Hi. Um, I want to actually I have two questions. So he's running for Senate now, so we're, we uh, very likely may lose him. But uh, uh, I think everybody knows here McGuire has been, uh, you know, working for us like crazy, and I have good contacts with them. Again, through my uh, through my work with Farm Bureau, um, I actually had the uh, opportunity to do some lobbying um, on behalf of Lake County, uh, both in Washington D.C. and also in Sacramento, um, for various different things. And I would I would continue to do that. I think you know we've we've got you know if nothing else, we have to use the momentum. That that you know is that experience with the, the Valley Fire, but boy, you know, um, did it open some doors for us and some opportunities? And yeah, if we don't take advantage of that, um, our bad. Thank you. I think what I'll bring to the table, obviously, is all the grant writing and or the grant experience that I have um, here in Lake County. Um, you know, I, I, I was sad to see that email back to Sally from Cal Fire and some of the grants that are available because we are missing out. And I think sometimes the opportunity is having the availability to have a grant writer, just see if that's going to be a viable opportunity for your community. You know, after the Valley Fire, you know, for the Middletown Rancheria, we were able to successfully get two grants. So we were uh, wildland interface, uh, urban interface grant that we got over $100,000 from the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the uh, United States Forest Service. We also got a, um, an erosion control grant, you know, so $250,000 that we were able to put together to work on things both on our property um, and to help the water flow through because we were thinking there was going to be floods. So being able to be out there and just looking at the grants that are available. Like I said, we are a low-income county. There are a lot of grants out there available through Nahasda, through HUD, you know, um, Rural Community Development, USDA. There are all kinds of things that we need to be looking at. And sometimes just thinking outside of the box. You get focused internally, but there's a lot of money that's available to us because we are, once again, like I said, one of the county in the West here. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you get to ask a question? Yeah, I remember it. We have lost a lot of individuals <coughs> after the fire, and our businesses have suffered because of those losses from our indivi the individual people that have moved out. So our businesses have suffered. The time's going to come when we're going to get some growth in Lake County from from housing. We, we know that's fact because it's happened before. When the prices go up down there, people want to come to Lake County because it's cheaper to buy homes. How, how do you see your self acting when people want to put subdivisions here? Are you in favor of growth by way of housing, or are you opposed to that part of growth? Because I don't think we can have growth in businesses without more people. We need people. 
our businesses meet people. I think anyone that's in business will tell you they could handle 100 more customers a day. So how, how do you see yourself acting when and if that surge comes or that potential surge comes, how will you react to that, to those, to those questions about housing growth? As for both of you, please. Okay. Thank you, Fletcher. Yep. I think it needs to be approached, approached very responsibly. The number one thing that you hear from this community, and I myself really believe in it, is keeping the small town aspect that we have here. And bringing in the tourism or bringing in more houses is going to be something that we really got to balance. So I think as a District 1 supervisor, we'll be working with the Planning Commission and everybody else and our community here of where the growth is going to happen. You know, I think one of the worst things could happen is the growth happening all along Highway 29 from here to Hidden Valley and then up. You know, I think we lose the small town aspect at that point. So looking in what areas we could develop, whether it's out on Butts Canyon or some other opportunities to be away from downtown where we can still get the development that we need and still have the people close enough where they can come and they can go into our businesses and do that economic development growth. And I know there are some restrictions and maybe some changes that need to be happened, but it is coming. I'm not the District 1 supervisor at this point, but all the time someone's like, hey, you know, Moke, I got an idea. We want to build over here. We want to do that. My first thing is, I'm not the supervisor. You need to talk with the Board of Supervisors if you're going to do something. Or the Planning Commission. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, again, I think I've stated before in, in, in uh, public sessions like this that the reason why I started running actually before the Valley Fire was because I saw growth and development coming. There was a time, uh, again, when I was planning commissioner that we were in a stage of growth when the Middletown area plan was being created. I think Jim can attest to this. There were all kinds of developers in that room presenting their projects. Then we went into recession. I see us, we're coming out of that recession. We are at the south end of the county here. We are primed for, for growth and development um, with or without the, the Valley Fire. It's, it is going to come. I think it, you know, as I said, stated earlier, any project, I'm looking for good project and for measures to be mitigated. Again, I applaud um, Ken Porter from Valley Oaks, you know, at, at meeting with the community as far as if it's a big development. Um, but I have a track record in uh, my planning um, uh, decisions that I've made, projects I've approved, and projects that I've denied. You know, basically, depending on whether they fit and they were good projects for this community and, um, you know, for our future. Thank you. I've been thinking about for years, and this, which you can just touch on this because this has been discussed for many, many hours over many, many years, and I can recall a long time ago that supervisor meetings or these warnings of this emergence for possibility of a muscle infestation in that lake. And the nightmare, so to speak, so I'm told, you know, uh, and probably not an exaggeration, but that would be for the lake and downstream and, and for Lake County. And I, and I followed that. I had followed it lately because I threw up my hands. It seemed to be every time the supervisors would have a meeting, it was much different than the one before and the one before and the one before. And they have a sticker program. And to get a sticker, you feel there's a screening process, which just you just fill out some pictures. Yeah. What's the, yeah, the question? Well, I'm leading up to something that can respond. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no enforcement that I know of. Like they had a hundred dollar fine for launching a little without a sticker, and then it went up to a thousand, and then it was down to a hundred dollars. Again, that I understand, but if, it, if it's already in the lake, it's too late anyway. So what I'm getting at is, is it seems to me that that lake is still in serious risk. What's the question? You got any thoughts on that? That's a good question. That's a good question. <laughs> yes. Well, part of it is is as you're doing now. Part of it is education. So again, there were three measures to save the lake. So all three failed. So they and that's because it was for a specific tax. So which meant that they had to get two thirds of the of the vote in order to pass. People didn't understand that, and people are mistrusting of government right now as far as the general voters, and we weren't able to get that message out to people that with, a, with that particular, for all three times, it was going to be a measure that would provide funding to do just that, to, to safe keep our lake, the, the lake of Clear Lake, as well as Hidden Valley Lake, um, because that's at risk also. 
um, in various different waterways. But so for that, it was very important, but people didn't understand and they mistrusted government that it would go into the general fund and then next year be used for whatever they wanted to. But it being a specific tax, it, it basically would have to be used for only those things that were outlined in the measure. But, but it was very, very difficult to educate the voting public <coughs> to do that. I know there's been quite a few measures and opportunities, I think, um, that, that have been attempted here as far as the lake. Um, the lake is dear and near to my heart. Um, you know, before even thinking about running District 1 Supervisor, it's something that we think about all the time as far as a tribal nation. We have EPA grants where there's water testing that's done in all the waterways that flow into that. And, and we do these things on our own because we really care about the environment. And we, we go out and we get these opportunities to track these things. So we're hoping we're building the case from the tribal standpoint where we not only can take it to the state level, but the federal level. And I really think it needs to be pushed at the federal level. It's the largest natural lake in North America. If you all watch the news this week, Obama went up to Lake Tahoe last week and they're freaking out because the clarity went from 86 feet down to 64. They're putting a billion dollars towards getting that lake going right over there. And I'm really concerned about there's not enough focus here from our local you know, supervisors, the districts. I know there's some things we've tried, but I think we really got to get a good, get a good plan together and really get Mike Thompson and other people on board to really start getting some dollars here and not put it on the backs of the people to really come up with a project to get it done. Before I ask my question, I'll tell you, I bought a boat recently. I launched it over at Lucerne, middle of the week, hardly anybody there. There was a guy there that wanted to make sure that I had the sticker. So somebody's out there doing it. Um, this is a, sort of a general question as to what your knowledge might be about this. I've come to the marijuana meetings. I've listened. I'm interested in knowing what's going on. I know it's going to have a huge uh, economic impact. I've recently made uh, a few trips over to Calaveras County, uh, possibly going to be doing some work for them. And they, of course, have fired almost the same time as Butte Fire. They lost almost a thousand homes over there. I don't know what their other industry is like. I don't know if they have you know, a lot of agriculture and so forth. I don't know that much about that county. What I do know is I met, went and met with several real estate people, and they told me as a result, they thought of both the fire and the marijuana coming in, that property values on raw land had just gone through the sea. They said, we're selling property for more than double what it would have sold for a couple of years ago. My question is, are you aware? Do you think that'll happen here? Are these things that are concerns? I think it may already be happening here. Yeah, absolutely aware. I think from day one when I stood up here in front, it is one of the issues um, that is coming down the pipe. I will tell you, I, my personal knowledge, Department of Justice wrote, you know, about a year, 18 months ago, maybe or so, Department of Justice put out a thing, oh, you can grow marijuana on a, on a, on a tribal land. Completely, that is not what it said. Um, but that's what everybody construed it as. So we had industry folks from Colorado, Washington, every place knocking on our door, talking about, hey, we'll give you $10 million. We'll give you $15 million. The industry is here. They are well organized. They have plans put together to buy property. They have just cash stuffed in their mattresses because they can't put it in the banks. And it's an industry that is happening. It's probably happening right now in Lake County, even though it may be a little under the radar. It's coming, folks. Like I said, we directly were impacted by just a simple memo with the Department of Justice, and we need to have a plan together because these aren't just, these are large corporations that are going to be coming in and trying to really take this thing over. And to that point, that's one of the reasons why the Measure N was put on the books in order to be able to, to put some guidance around the uh, cannabis, the medicinal marijuana grows. Um, so there was just a bust here recently that was in the paper that basically if you looked at all the folks that were arrested, they were all from Fresno. And they're all from Fresno because Fresno has banned cannabis. <laughs> so they're coming here. So you're right. Um, you know, in property sales, uh, and that's what actually the re some real estate folks were a little bit upset when Measure N went on the book, uh, in that article, known as Article 72, because that curbed their, their real estate sales. So, so you're right, I mean, this is a way for us to kind of take control. And so as we uh, refine measure um, Article 72, I mean, we really need to look at that so that we can maintain that balance and maintain the, the, uh, the special place that the Lake County is and also maintain the health of our lake because, because that 
you know, will also impact. Um, is there greater so control because of small right. sizes? I think you get one question. <laughs> Breaking the rules. <laughs> I know Moke's uh, flexibility um, and his commitment to open an office here in Middletown. And so, Monica, I wanted to um, hear, because I know at your introduction you talked about, you know, where you came from and your travels and everything, but I didn't catch what um, what you do for a living, your livelihood, and, and, and because I know a lot of the supervisors now have other jobs and they, they own other companies and so forth, and I was just interested in, in your livelihood and would you continue to do that and serve as supervisor, and are you definitely committed to opening an office here in Middletown? I'll answer the office question first. So I don't know about a, a, that costs money, you know, also that the county pays for. Correct, Jim? So, so I'm not sure about about that. I would try to find like a satellite, you know, to rent, you know, a little space in somebody else's office that where I can be accessible. But again, as I stated earlier, I really feel that it's important to go out into the community, into Anderson Springs, into the Lower Lake area, and for me to go to where your office is, as opposed to expecting you to come to my office. Um, so that's that's one thing. Then the um, the other thing about what I do. <laughs> I, I have been uh, um, an active volunteer in the community, number one, but my job, my paying job is actually I grow grapes. So I am a wine grape grower, so uh, my husband and I manage 140 acres. Uh, we have 20 acres ourselves and we lease 10 acres on the property that adjoins us. So, and so total we have about 140 acres there. We have 40 acres of vineyards planted and some dry farmed walnuts. So that's basically what I do. What I would do is to move my, um, I would hire people to be doing more of my vineyard work than I do. So. Oh, it's okay. Come back to me. Second question. Oh, I, I just wanted to ask uh, if you would be, if you would be more specific as to how you think the way that the that the rules are being written here will help minimize. Uh, I've heard there are like restrictions on the sizes of the land. So does that help uh, keep keep some of these really really big corporations, you know, less interested? I wasn't I, I just wasn't clear. If you just uh, well, explain. there's two different things. I mean, there's the the cannabis uh, business that we can control, and then there's the illegal cannabis. And I believe it's going to take us several years to kind of get that under control. So first off, you know what we can control, and those cannabis growers who really want to comply and want to be small business owners here, they're ready and willing to do so. And so that's what we have to provide the framework in order for them to do so and then allow our law enforcement, uh, as Mo alluded to, you know, also as far as that hopefully as we go through this in taxation and all that we have more funds to hire more law enforcement because it will take more law enforcement. Um, also, it, it's not a matter of just supplying who we have. We're, this whole business is going to create, you know, new jobs. <laughs> but we also have to fund those jobs. So, um, so, but then we have the illegal part. And again, we need to provide the tools and allow our uh, law enforcement to be able to go after those illegal grows uh, that you know, are detrimental to our environment. And also, you know, I mean, first off, it's, it's uh, uh, protecting, uh, <laughs> respect the red. I think the bottom line of your answer to your question is making sure that all the ordinances are developed as we move forward through the process. Because right now there are some put in place, but in November that's going to change a little bit because now it's going to be legal just for recreational. And those are things that are still being worked on, I think. So, you know, just coming up and trying to do it responsibly, I think, is the biggest part of it. And setting up the regulatory part of it. You know, everybody thought when Indians, you know, tribes got gaming, it was going to be a free-for-all. It's going to be a horrible thing for the communities they're in. It was going to destroy things. I think we've proven we're responsible business owners. We're able to license, regulate everybody who works for us, their background check. We know everything about them before they step on the property and get a license. We make sure that the community is protected. And I think that's going to be a very big part. And not only is it with our employees and all of our people that work for us, but it's also the vendors, the people who are transporting food to and from us. Machines are done both through regulatory regulation process both from us it's also sent to the sheriff's department and the highway patrol when we're moving stuff across the product so it really comes down to the ordinances and how they're developed and then the regulation part along with that so okay, 
So what are you ready for? Because I understand that, and I would like to hear specifics, I think. I understand that there are counties that are in the same boat that have already developed policies that they don't allow very much business in from without, that they really are protecting their local growers. And I would say, too, that if we let a whole bunch of businesses in here, we're not going to have what we have anymore. They, they'll, it will end up, and I'm not against pot necessarily, but it's, it's like I don't want to smell skunk all fall, and I also don't want the guns, and I also don't, and I also don't want to see all of the agriculture here turning into marijuana, just like I don't want to see it all turning into grapes. And so, so the question is, like, how are we going to protect Lake County, and what is your vision for that? Like specifically, ordinances, I understand that specifically. How are we going to protect the county? I, I think one thing that we won't have control of, and a prime example, an individual may read through the ordinance of the law, say, hey, I might have a piece of property that might fit exactly to what it needs to be in the ordinance where I could sell it, and I, I don't want to grow pot, but I could sell it to somebody who maybe want to come in and start something. They have the right size property and those types of things. That's going to be tough to control. I think we run into a little bit of the situation there where, uh, you know, for just go back to the Dollar General. It was zoned for the right reason. An individual landowner said, you know what, I see an opportunity here. I'm going to move forward. And that's going to be something very tough to protect if you're an individual landowner. I think the rest of the stuff, as far as protecting the community, it is the ordinances and the laws that are put into place. And we're going to have to battle very hardly for that. And the District 1 supervisor and the entire board of supervisors needs to do that. A, a direct plan. It's a new industry. To say that you have the answers before it gets started, it's going to be a moving target. Colorado, Washington, these other places that have done it, they're learning on the fly. And we've had a lot of our people have gone back and looked at that. Yeah, and so to that point, I mean, that was one of the reasons why I worked so hard on the campaign to, to make sure that Measure N, Article 72, was put in place because that's an ordinance that can be changed. And the, the, um, the measures that were, were competing against that measure row would have been locked in place for five years and only changeable by going to the ballot. So, and with this, because it is a moving target, this industry, that's what I think we need to have that flexibility. To answer your question, uh, though, as far as specifically, again, um, and I applaud uh, Bob Mazzarelli, our new community development director, who is bringing some new ideas and some fresh ideas here to the area. And he is proposing an overlay uh, a zoning that would identify the same as we have identified, you know, where ag lands are, you know, and, and what can be grown there and where residential development is. This overlay zoning would identify where cannabis can be grown. So, um, so that is in the works right now, and that's what will be reviewed here in the next few months. Good. We're going to close. We're going to close the questions. Questions about time for one more. Who's going to ask it? Me. Go ahead. Well, both you guys were talking about the. Uh, I'm Tom Darn, by the way. Um, the advent of these people coming in and purchasing properties and stuff. Up to this point, it hasn't been a legal entity. So now all of a sudden, these people are bringing cash in to the county. What is your guys' opinions on? Uh, the aspect of money laundering and or cartel coming in. Uh, how do we regulate? How would you how would you guys decide to regulate how where the money trail is coming from? Because obviously if it's cash and they can't put it in the bank and they have to keep it in their mattress, there's something fishy there. There's no taxes being paid on it right now. So I'm I'm curious about what you guys would say about that. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> And again, this is when Measure N was going on. We have a gentleman here who, who I, I don't want to get too long in the story, but I actually met him in Yosemite. There's just two of us in, or three of us in a room. Yes, and that's what he invested in property here in cash um, to grow cannabis here. So, and then he was he lived in Arizona. So you're right. And when when he was here and explaining this great business that this could be, and, and I asked him that direct question, how much tax are you paying here in this county? And he said, when I show a profit. <laughs> so, so it is an issue. Um, but again, these are two separate things. There is, you know, what we're trying to build a framework around for legal growth, for legal cannabis, medicinal marijuana growing, um, versus, you know, the illegal, which is going to have to be handled by law enforcement. And again, a good reason why we need to keep funding our law enforcement. 
Number one, I think the money issue needs to be figured out by the federal government. You know, where they can, you know, start having banks or something where they can put that in there. The regulation part, as I talk about, is number one. So we talk about a cash business. I will go back to what we were in 1999. From 94 to 99, we were an unregulated business. I myself was under arrest as the tribal chairman from the FBI. We were in organized crime and all these types of things with the illegal gambling. We had the right, we went to court, we won. We got a compact. What that meant was before that time, we didn't know. We could put our money in a bank, but the account could be closed the next day. And we had to go through that for quite a few years before we got the compact. So the regulation part, what you're asking about, Tom, of how to track the money, who's investing, who's doing those types of things, is the most important part of this industry. Because just like in our industry, if you guys all know and read your history books, who started Las Vegas was the mob. Once they started going through the process, the regulation, where the money's coming from, they were able to slowly but surely weed that out of, the, out of that industry. And that's the same thing we need to do here. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're just going to let everybody catch your breath for a second, and then we'll have Monica have her summation. And we'll close it. We'll have five minutes. Anytime you're ready, you can start, Monica. Again, thank you all for coming. And thank you for the for the questions. As far as there's some really good questions, I really appreciate uh, being able to to uh, answer them and, and have, you know, it almost feels kind of like a discussion. Um, Again, I'm running for supervisor uh, because I am invested in, in this county. Um, as I said before, I have moved my entire life. This is the longest I've ever been anywhere. Uh, this is uh, this is very special and dear to me. And I've run into so many people with stories. I'm, I'm a member of the Rotary Club, you know, also. And a gentleman just told a story. They do a little craft talk during Rotary and, uh, you know, kind of share their story. He shared the reason why he ended up here and, and for he and his wife that, you know, in coming here, this was home. Um, I've been to Anderson Springs and talked to so many of those people there, you know, also that, um, you know, have traditions. So many of them don't live here. I think half of the Anderson Springs community, right, lives? No, that's too much. Yeah. Okay. So, third? But anyway, you have you have people uh, in the About Anderson. A fourth or summer. <coughs> three fourths before. Okay. The fire. Yeah, before the fire. You're right. So, but they have um, years and years and years of, of tradition, you know, here in in, uh, in Lake County, and and to me that's just heartwarming and, and worth working for and protecting. I have uh, a record of being proactive in um, in my pursuit of, of of doing just that, preserving the the quality of, of life here in Lake County, both for today and for, uh, for the future. I uh, strive for balance. I embrace diversity, so which again is one of the things that really drew me here to, to live here in Middletown. Um, so and I know I've heard Fletcher say this, and it's a comment that I've made, is that we have the, uh, excuse me, but you know, I could say we have the Cowboys and the Indians, and you know, we have the tie dye, and we're all surrounded by love, you know. Um, so it's a great place to be. There's so many different, uh, there's so many different people here, and you see that, and that's one of the things that I learned from working in the Planning Commission, also, is going out to the various different, there, man, we have so many wonderful, sweet little pockets, you know, in, in communities, and we have what we have here in South Lake County, but throughout this whole county, it's just absolutely gorgeous. So as your next supervisor, I do, <laughs> I promise to, um, to, to treat this place well and to listen to you. I think that that's very important, you know, to carry forward. My job would be to represent the people of, of District 1. Um, so I would promise to make uh, common sense decisions. I think that that's what, you know, I'm really grounded in. I also have uh, a knack for bringing people together to find common ground and move forward towards workable solutions. I think I'm one of the uh, first people, um, in fact, in a conversation I had with McGuire, um, he said he thinks I'm one of the first people in the state of California to bring Sierra Club and Farm Bureau to the same table to find that common ground and move forward in the best interest of, of Lake County. So I have served on a number of different uh, committees over the, the years, both as a board member and, um, you know, or just as, as a member. Again, I worked uh, five years with Farm Bureau as a director. I've also worked with the, uh, with the Sierra Club. So I am appointed by the Board of Supervisors to work on the Workforce Development Board, uh, working to improve the job situation. One of those is um, Andy Nestor. 
has been working very closely now here with businesses throughout Lake County, but also here I know is working with Mark Rediker, um, you know, in order to improve our business, especially in the aftermath of the fire, because we do, we have suffered a great loss and we need, we need to support our, our local businesses. So um, with that, most importantly, I plan to serve you and I plan to serve with integrity. And I would be honored if you would, um, if I would receive your vote for, on November 8th for your next county supervisor representing District 1. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, my entire life has prepared me to be the District 1 supervisor here uh, in our area. You know, I've worked diligently as a tribal leader to create jobs and have economic impact right here in the county. Over 262 jobs at this point, and we still need more people to work. So if someone needs to go to work, there are job opportunities at the casino. So over the past 20 years in building that business, um, we have had, you know, I, you know, have had a personal hand in having one heck of an impact here in our community. There are 262 employees, 18 are tribal members at the casino. The rest of those folks work here. Some of the people in this room have worked for us out of our facility, and I can't appreciate that enough. Linda being one of them, thank you for your service when you work there. But those are things that I've done for the community. I also coach at the high school. I'm a mentor to the kids, you know, as um, they grow up. I've got a bunch of kids that I've coached who are now in the sheriff's department, the fire department, and it's a way to do things. You know, as a big guy, as I am, naturally, and as a leader, I've done, you know, everything to help everybody when, I, when I'm asked to do that. I'm always available. I work hard for this community. I love it. You see me around doing different types of things during the fire. You know, it was one of the most horrible things we had gone through. We took care of our community as a tribe, and we also took care of this community here. And we wanted to make sure when people came home that they had the best that they could have, even if, even if they had lost things. I stood in the ashes and cried with many friends and family, you know, as they came back. And it was a horrible thing. But the one thing that was always there was, I'm going to be here for you. And I want to be the district one super to help you recover. And I'm not talking about it. We have people that are going into homes. We've already built five on the rancheria. We've got one for my daughter. I know Hope City is doing a great job here locally. Uh, myself and Monica are both on TLC, you know, as far as that recovery process goes from day one. As District 1 supervisor, I will always be available and I'll be someone that you can approach on any issue. I talk about having an office, but I also said I will go out and see everybody. But I think there needs to be one central place that you can come and you can talk to your supervisor. And I'm not asking the county to pay for it. When I say I'm going to get an office, I'm going to be paying for that because I believe you need to be in your community and to understand your community to be a leader. And I've done that for over 20 years with the tribe. Is everybody happy? Absolutely not. You can't make everybody happy. Some people are going to agree with you and some are going to disagree. But if the overall benefit is good for the community, then tough decisions need to be made. You know, and I, you know, I, I do pride, you know, Jim made a tough decision catching some flack for it here recently. But I think overall, he believes that was a good decision for the community. And sometimes those are tough decisions that need to be made. From my point of view, being able to recuse myself, someone asked about a conflict of interest. How hard do you think that is with 200 people that I'm related to when we're making decisions on housing, education, those types of things? You've got to be able to separate um, things, and you've got to be able to recuse yourself if you think there is a conflict of interest. And those are things that I've worked on over the years. And I've also been able to stand up and say, hey, I was wrong. Oh man, I'll tell you when I'm wrong. If I made a wrong decision, I may have felt good about it at one point, but if I go back and I think about it and I'm wrong, I'll come tell you, hey, I was wrong, I apologize, and we'll try and move forward from there. Whether or not you accept that, that's up to you, but I will do my best to try and make good decisions you know, in the future. And I do use common sense. That's what I'm on. I learned most of my skills and my opportunities. I went to school, but out on the football field. You know, you're a leader. By not talking a whole bunch, I do out here in the community, but you know, uh, on the football field, I just try and lead. You know, and what's good for the entire community is good for me. You know, I don't drive around a Lincoln or a Cadillac saying, you know, I'm the leader and I'm the boss and you need to listen to me. I try and get everybody's point of view and help people move forward and make smart decisions. 
We're on the cusp right now, economic development as a tribe, we have an opportunity to move forward. We're working diligently to do that. You know, we got some pretty good amount of money and expansion stuff we're going to be doing. But here as a community, I think there's a real opportunity that we need to take advantage of as we regrow both with housing and economic development. And we have helped felt the hurt at the brewery, you know, since the fire. There was a big influx with the workers, but now we've been able to work with the Rotary and some other things. We've got a grant, we've got new websites. We've got to market ourselves better and have an opportunity to do that to get the people up here. It was not a great way that Middletown and Lake County got into the news with these fires. But we need to build on that and marketing ourselves of what we have to offer as community and individuals and what we have here as natural resources and potential business uh, economic development expansion. And those are things we got to focus on and make sure that our youth always knows that we love them and we take care of our tribal elders. Those are number one. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank the candidates for coming. I'm going to ask the candidates, it's relatively early, um, to stick around. If you have some specific questions you want to talk to them about, them, I'm going to ask them to stay a little bit and give you a chance to come up, meet them up close and personal, and ask any questions that you have still in your mind. Okay? Thank you for coming. We will have another forum in October, our, our regular scheduled meeting will be, part of that meeting will be formed very much like this, but we'll also have agenda items. Okay? Yes, in October. Right? Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> meeting adjourned.